is this the perfect episode of The Office? Probably not, but I couldn't think of a better way to start this video. Hey everybody, we moved from Christmas to St. Patrick's Day in just a week or two. Far from perfect, St. Patrick's Day has a bunch of stuff to talk about, so we're just gonna get right into it. I understand nothing. Just because Joe has no life does not mean that the rest of us don't have lives. So I should state for the record, I am Irish, like super Irish, I think. Angela's ashes, top of the morning to it. Frankie's prose is finer than a pasta gold, say I. Not like 100% on that, but that's the hearsay from my folks a few years ago. Like as in like three years ago, I heard for the first time that I was completely Irish. So I think I've been missing out on St. Patrick's Day festivals my entire life. Or carnivals. Yeah. Probably not though. I'm pretty sure this is an extrovert's holiday. Top of the morning to ya. Which is funny because I never really thought about holidays being introvert versus extrovert. But I was watching this during Christmas break while I was sitting peacefully in my little cave here. And I just thought, God. I hate crowds. Stanley hates crowds, kids and music. And that's like all St. Patrick's Day is. What the hell's going on back there? So I haven't been missing it my whole life. I did look it up though. Scranton does have a pretty huge cut of their population claiming Irish heritage. Are there a lot of Irish people living around here? Yes. yes. Oh, I hate that. Of which I don't know much about at all. I mean, my boss is Irish right now. Like, I mean, he's always been Irish. He's born and raised in Dublin. I just mean currently my current boss is Irish. Uh, literally one of the nicest, most genuine guys I've ever worked for in my career. And I don't know if he watches these videos, but man, he's got a great accent. Says some amazing things. Sorry, mate. I forgot me, me snotted cream. <laughs> and these are like literal things my boss has said. Hi, Chris, we have but a fortnight before Christmas and we lose everyone's attention over the holidays. Keep me between the ditches on this, but I reckon it might be wisest to get everyone's attention by putting some time on everyone's diary to settle up, eh? Let's keep from running around like headless chicken on this one, eh? Good man. This monologue you're delivering is very offensive. Sorry if I just offended an entire population of people. I did have this conversation on Discord about whether or not St. Patrick's Day is somehow cultural appropriation. That's for everyone else to decide, but not me. Okay, but all of that to say, do people wear kilts on St. Patrick's Day? It's a kilt. I thought this was a Scottish thing, not an Irish thing. Scottish. Is this a serious question here? If someone can explain that to me, I'll pin the, you know, thing in the comments. Also, does Andy actually have a sister? It's actually my sister's old field hockey skirt. Okay, and Michael has a flag on his desk, which is definitely not Ireland's. Bonus points if you know where it's from. Can I feel a pele? No, Bulgaria. On that note, let's have a quick gander around the office to see what the set designers did to dress up the office for St. Patrick's Day. All right, let's speed through this. We've got the green M&Ms from the cold opening. Green M&Ms, nature's Viagra. You're thinking of deer penis. We've got happy St. Patrick's Day decor on Aaron's desk. The water in the water bottle is dyed green if you didn't notice it. We've got more St. Patrick's Day decor on the cabinets. Flags on Meredith and Creed's and Michael's desk. And is the exit sign normally green? Yeah, I went back to the banker episode. For like one frame, you could see it when he's walking in. And I like, I didn't realize these things were ever green. And then while I was looking at background stuff, I had to look up how long Dwight's been growing beets at his desk. Like, was that just something I missed? And no, I think it was just intended to show the gap while Jim was out on paternity leave, which I love the little details. Bonus points if you could tell me what game Dwight's playing here. I literally have no idea. I play a lot of first person shooters, enough to know that this is not how you play a first person shooter. Back to the decor, Daryl has some greenery in his office, and then there's some garland slung around a few places. Uh, switching over to costume design then. I would like you to do costume design, obviously. Andy's wearing the kilt, has a green tie. I'm in my worky works. Michael also has a green tie. Good morning, honey pile. And Jim has a green tie as does Stanley, as does Oscar, as does Creed. As has Creed, as has Michael, and as has Holly. As has Kevin. Kevin went all in. She goes to another school. Meredith looks like she's running for mayor of Scranton or something. And I'm a little weird with colors sometimes, but I'm pretty sure Dwight's shirt, though it's 
predominantly gray. It does have like a green hue to it, so I think that works. Aaron's got a green top and a green cardigan, as does Phyllis. Kelly has a green top, and Ryan's got this dull, pale green thing going on. Cece's is decked out in green as Kevin, and that makes Angela, Gabe, Gabe. Joe, and the warehouse guys all countercultural, and probably all for different reasons. I will date when I'm dead. <laughs> Joe, don't give a what. All right then. And really just saying countercultural, it's kind of crazy to see Angela's response to her coworker's illness. I think this just feels different now. Like the idea of someone putting on a mask, no less like a custom embroidered one, used to be pretty foreign to the majority of Americans before the pandemic. And it's just kind of interesting to me how like real world events can change the reading of this somewhat. There's too many people on this earth. We need a new plague. It's kind of like how Cats in the Cradle really has a different tone once you become a parent. The cats in the cradle and the silver spoon. Yeah. Little boy blue and the man and the moon. No, we can definitely talk. Dwight's quest to get back to Mega Desk is very relatable for me. Is volcanic, and it is about to erupt with the molten hot lava of strategy. It resonates because I had a desk, a pretty sweet desk set up during the pandemic at my office building, which is like 10 minutes away. And this building of like 2000 some people, there's maybe a hundred people in there throughout the majority of this last year. Uh, so like the gym, the coffee shop, the cafeteria, all of it just empty and no lines. All the conveniences of being in the office with you know, none of the hassle of dealing with other human beings. Anyway, my assigned desk was in this dark sector of the building, like a windowless bastion of sadness. But every time I'd go to the bathroom or get coffee or something, I'd walk through my wing, walking like through the desk area instead of the aisle because it was 32 steps to take, you know, the way through the desks. And yes, I counted it because that's who you're currently listening to, a person who counts their steps to make sure that you know, I've taken the most efficient way to the bathroom. Uh, my forms are gonna be- I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Welcome to my channel. So on these frequent trips, I'd pass by this little cove of desk that were situated on an exterior wall with the bright sun shining upon it. And I said to myself like, this is gonna be mine. So I casually walk by, check the name tag on the name plates when the desk was completely empty, by the way. And the name tag read an acquaintance of mine, a fellow Chris. Someone that I might call a friend. In fact, a Facebook friend. A friend who I witnessed just a little bit ago, like this rant on his Facebook about how amazing his work from home area was and how he was never gonna come back to the office. I wanna start telecommuting from home. It's a safety issue. Really? So I started what I call hoteling at Chris's desk. Nothing official because when you start asking for things, you know, people start asking questions. Why do you need this? What's going on? What's wrong with your desk? Anyway, I was here for months. The lighting was amazing. I was getting my daily dose of vitamin D. The climate control was awesome. I didn't need to wear my mid-afternoon cardigan. You always want to keep a sweater or cardigan of some sort in case it gets drafty. And the view it was fine. I got to see how car dealerships are built. So yeah, that's cool, I guess. Um, I spent several months in my sweet mega desk area all by myself, sequestered from the rest of the riffraff. And then October hits and with it, this return to office mandate. And I get this message from honestly quite awesome departmental admin. And she's like, hey, Chris, um, I noticed you've been sitting at this spot and that's that's not your spot. And I said, yeah, well, I'm just I'm just hoteling here. And she was like, oh, that's not a thing. Um, we're gonna need to move you because one of our executive, you know, one of our executives directs are gonna need a seat by the window. And I'm just trying to keep everyone happy. <sighs> the city. I'm trying to keep everyone happy? Does, does that include me? Um, clearly I didn't say that because I had no right to this desk anyway. All of that to say, I've been working from here since I got moved back to my windowless cove of sadness. Seasonal affective disorder, AKA sad. That sounds like a very real thing, Toby. It's just hard to go back to sitting with the plebes after you had it so good. How was Jamaica? It was so good. Oh. But with that, 
let's dive into the deeper meaning. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. Do you work to live or live to work? I think that's the question this episode is asking. Jo is as intense as she is pleasant. She commands the office with this folksy iron fist. Enough! And this is what she's signed up for. It's what she's about. She's got her company. She's got her dogs. <laughs> Gabe tries to follow in that corporate life too, with a little less success. Take Jim's old office. Oh, um, I set my stuff up in there. So just give me a few minutes to clean it out for you. And he's putting the rest of his life on hold because his time and energy all gets devoted to his job. And I think what's implied here is that he's paying for companionship. Portrait of a prostitute. And then we have this killer line from Michael that I think confirms this deeper meaning too. 26, single, tied to my desk, no life, no family. I want to have been married by the time I would have turned 30. And then when you look at Daryl, he's got the eye of the CEO, but at what cost? We're here to bust you out. I wish, but I... Uh... Dude, your shirt tucked in? <coughs> oh, yeah. Um, I must have did that when I used the bathroom. And then the Jim Dwight stuff with the mega desk is interesting because Dwight's driven by his work and by his pleasure, and Jim's driven by his relationships. And his job always comes second to that. I am not surprised that Dwight's using my baby to steal my desk. I'm a little surprised that it's working. At least for now. I liked our life in Scranton. And I have started a business in Philadelphia. <laughs> and the rest of the Scranton branch is dying to leave to go to their St. Patrick's Day celebration, but they stick it out for the sole reason of not wanting to get fired. And the Andy Aaron plotline, how does that fit into this? Nice to meet you, Andy Bernard. Cold hands. <laughs> Are we rotating seats or? It doesn't. I think they're just trying to be weird and they nailed it. Nailed it. Personally, I think that I relate the most with Jim's motives here. It must be amazing being a father, right? The miracle of life. It is, big time. And I think that also maybe puts me in Packers category. Maybe next queer. But I care about my job, like I really do. But my family comes first, right? Like I work really hard. But that work is a means to an end, not the end itself. And I'm not trying to throw shade at anyone who looks at life differently. I think that's the point of this episode is that it's just a look at how choices on what you decide is most important will always have implications. And uh, like a 30 Rock type of theme, you can't have it all. But with that, let's rate this thing. This is the worst. <laughs> All right, so the cold opening. It does a fine job of setting up the St. Patrick's Day framing for the episode. Michael's ignorance on the point of St. Patrick's Day does make for a really good punchline. It is the closest that the Irish will ever get to Christmas. But it's pretty low energy, and it feels a little disjointed from the episode overall, so I give it a two out of five. And for the rest of St. Patrick's Day episode, I love the set dressing, I love the costume design, you guys know I love every time Kathy Bates is on screen. We are gonna miss you so much, you so well, okay. Especially with these dogs. I relate so much to the corporate stuff in this one, like the Sabre, Dunder Mifflin era thing, it, like this. I am so proud of Sabre's Print in All Colors initiative. It's so corporate, and I think they nail the tone of that very well. But in general, this episode's plot lines are a little hit and miss for me. I, I mean, clearly I think we're supposed to hate Aaron and Andy's first date. My feet aren't smelly. They smell like roses. Smell them. Oh. <laughs> I tried to find this actor. He's not been in much else. I couldn't find any contact information. So if you know this guy or you've seen this guy or you are this guy, get in contact with me. I'd love to hear more about what direction Einhorn gave him on this episode. Like, did you come up with a backstory for yourself? <laughs> what might that backstory be? Formative years. <laughs> I also have a bone to pick with Michael's complete weirdness in this episode. If you ever get down in my neck of the woods, you got a place to stay. So How about July 4th weekend. 
Oh, honey, you didn't buy a ticket. Like, on one hand, this is the type of social miscue that is exactly why we all love Michael, I think. Pull the trigger right Enough! Now. All right, everybody, just try to put a brave face on. But it seems uncharacteristically dumb of Michael. As in, this is a joke that would land better for, you know, Abed and Community, and not, you know, the office using it for Michael Scott in season six. Where's Michael Snot? We've seen Michael pick up on nuance and pleasantries before. No. This guy can sell paper Stop to a tree. Stop Ow. So this just feels forced, unfortunately. Some people don't really pick up on Subtle social cubes. Now, the writers needed Michael to be whimsically literal in this episode, and that's how they wrote him. Okay. But hey, the mega desk stinger just feels so officey. They call it quad desk. That's ridiculous. This is made up of three desks. Hello, Dwight Trude. Overall, though, I give this one a two out of five. This is outrageous. And before you storm to the comments yelling at me, I'm just going to remind you again that I grade on the office curve. So two out of five doesn't mean that I think it's like close to the worst thing that's ever been produced. This just means on a scale of office episodes, I think it rates a little lower. And a one out of five doesn't mean it's the worst garbage ever. And a five out of five doesn't mean it's the best thing that's ever been produced out of all humanity. It just means on a scale of office episodes, that's that's where I put it. Okay, so that's all I have to say about St. Patrick's Day. Uh, what's your thoughts? Leave them in the comments. I have an idea for suntan lotion soap. Thank you so much, guys, for watching. Next week, we're going to be talking with Brent Forrester on the new Leeds episode. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time. The cat's in the cradle and the silver spoon. Yeah. Little boy blue and the man and the moon. No, we can definitely talk about when it next time. You know what, can I call you back? That'd be great. Thank you. Be together then. Oh, yeah, you're gonna have a good time.